Hello everyone. In this video I'm going to be talking about spherical geometry, which is also known as Riemannian geometry. In particular, I'm going to be covering spherical triangles and their areas, which are essentially covered with Girard's theorem, but more on that later. First, let's get our definition of a spherical triangle straight. So in this picture, the triangle ABC is a spherical triangle. Well, what is a spherical triangle? A spherical triangle is quite obviously a triangle which is mapped onto a sphere, but which is bounded by three great circles. As in this case, a triangle ABC is bounded by the yellow great circle, the red great circle, and the blue great circle. So you might ask, what is a great circle? Well, to put it simply, a great circle is the largest possible circle which you can map onto a sphere. In this case, it is shown in red. Well, in order to create a great circle, you can essentially pass a plane through a sphere, and as soon as that plane intersects with the very center of that sphere, then the resulting intersection with the sphere will create a great circle. Okay, so now that we've got the great circle covered, we can move on to the loom. Well, the loom is a section of a sphere which is bounded by two great half circles. In this case, this is the first great half circle, and this is the second great half circle. The area in between them, which is shaded in gray, is the loom. Okay, we also need to clarify one other very important concept, and this is uh, when we're actually identifying spherical triangles. So in this picture, triangle PCD is obviously a spherical triangle, as it is bounded by, as we've mentioned previously, by three great circles. However, um, although triangle PAB also looks like a spherical triangle, it's actually not. Can you see why? Well, this is because the side AB does not actually belong to a great circle, and therefore the resulting shape is not actually a spherical triangle. Alright, so now let's discuss some basic properties of spherical triangles. So, as we can see here, triangle ABC is a spherical triangle. And um, as we all know, in Euclidean geometry, um, the interior angles of a normal triangle always add up to 180 degrees. Now, for spherical triangles, this is not that concrete, as uh, the sum of those interior angles, such as alpha, beta, and gamma, can in fact range. I.e., the sum um, can range between 540 degrees and 180 degrees. So, therefore, for each triangle, there can be a completely different sum of its interior angles, as long as it doesn't equal to equal or exceed 540 degrees, on the, uh, as long as it doesn't equal or um, be smaller than 180 degrees. So, another interesting concept about uh, spherical triangles is that there's not just one type of angle. So, so far we've talked about the more, uh, the more familiar angle types, so uh, we've talked about the interior angles. However, the sides of the triangle, the spherical triangle, such as side uh, CB, for instance, uh, they can also be described as angles. So this might seem bizarre at first, but uh, I can clarify this a bit. So, um, so we can see here, since the spherical triangle, um, this is the origin here, well, the center of the sphere, and all of those sides can be labeled as R for radius. So, therefore, each of the sides can be described as a certain angle, which is defined by the, the two radiuses coming out from the center of the sphere. So, side uh, CB can be described in terms of the angle A. Similarly, side BA can be described as an angle C, and side C CA can be described of an angle B. So now this is very interesting because that means that we can take sines and cosines of the actual sides of the triangle, which we can't do obviously in Euclidean geometry. Okay, so another interesting concept is spherical excess. So in this case, it is represented by the letter E. So that's the uh, spherical excess. Well, what the spherical excess is, is that, as you probably guessed, it's by how much the sum of the interior angles deviates from 180 degrees. Well, 
that might make some, some sense because the 180 degrees is the norm um, well at least for Euclidean triangles and therefore it makes sense to call such a deviation in the spherical excess a by how much the sum of the interior angles of a spherical triangle exceeds 180 degrees okay so now moving on to the most interesting part since we now have all of the necessary vocabulary and background we can therefore start to uh, prove Girard's theorem uh, visually so in this case we're going to be trying to derive the theorem for this uh, white triangle which will be labeled as triangle T so first of all it's necessary to label all of the vertices and the interior angles of this triangle so in this case the vertices they will, they will be labeled as capital R, G and B and the interior angles will be labeled as, uh, labeled as small uh, R, G and B in this case uh, R, G and B stands for uh, red, green and blue respectively so you might ask which, which uh, vertex am I supposed to label so you're, you're actually supposed to label um, the vertex um, whatever color the triangle opposite is so in this case this is um, vertex G because in this case the white triangle is opposite the green triangle also um, it's worthy to mention that those two angles are opposite angles and therefore they're equal as a result of this and using our previous uh, terminology we can establish that there are two congruent loons here so this is the first loon so this, this triangle and the grey triangles um, and this is the second loon the white triangle and the green triangle and we can actually start, start to notice that there are um, actually three looms which include our triangle. And in terms of the, the notation, uh, the looms will be labeled um, red because both of those congruent looms contain the red triangle, green and blue. Um, however, um, the looms which will be containing our white triangle will be labeled as L for loon subscript. R, G, or B, and the loons which are not containing our white triangle will be labeled similarly, but this time with a dash. And as it turns out, all of the loons which are labeled with a dash, so for example, this loon right there, all of them contain this interesting triangle. This interesting great triangle is actually directly opposite our required tri triangle T, this is, uh, and has exactly the same surface area and it can therefore be labeled as T dash, the antipodal triangle. Okay, so um, we can therefore find out that there are three loons containing our white triangle, and there are three loons which are not containing our white triangle, and those three loons which are not containing our white triangle, they actually contain this antipodal triangle. So if we decide to add up all of these loons, so for instance, this one plus 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 this one, uh, we will not uh, get the surface area of the sphere, obviously, because um, in, in this case the great uh, triangle will be counted two extra times, as well as this white triangle, which will also be counted two extra times. Okay, so this is the numerical derivation of this formula. So, as I said in the first step, uh, we're adding up all of the six loons. So uh, those three loons are the loons containing the white triangle, and those three loons represented by a dash are containing the antipodal triangle. And as I said, due to this um, overlap, what we actually get now is the surface area of the, sp of the sphere, um, and we get uh, twice the area of T and twice the area of the antipodal triangle. So in, uh, this actually sums up to be uh, four area T, because as I've mentioned, the antipodal triangle has exactly the same surface area as triangle T. Now, you might be asking, well, why is R squared present in all of those? Well, don't get confused, R is not the, um, the label of the vertex, R is simply the radius. And in this case, um, all of those formulas have simply been substituted into the formulas for the surface area of loons. So, in this case, um, we know that the surface area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared. And uh, if we want to find it out for the loon, we just simply need to multiply by theta over 2 pi. And therefore, uh, we'll get, uh, therefore, um, the resulting formula will become 2 r squared theta, which is exactly what you see here. So upon performing this step, um, all we do is we collect the like terms, and we end up with the, the area for the triangle being the sum of its angles, minus pi, that's all in brackets, multiplied by r squared, where r is the radius 